Okay. Good. What I'm hoping that we'll, we'll cover today is, yes, the way communication is changing, but also to see to what extent the qualifications that SQA develop actually manage that change and help with that change. Um, and we can have a debate around that. I don't think it's, it's straightforward. And obviously, I don't have all the answers to that because we're guided very much by what you think that um, learners should be learning about and how you would look at them and how you would support them. Quick poll. How comfortable are you with the digital context for communication? Now, some people think it is absolutely fantastic, it's absolutely squishy, you can do it any time you want, and really that's the way forward, everybody should be doing that. Others, a bit more reticent, no, we're only doing it because it's gimmicky, it's the way that um, employers like to use it, or it's for social reasons, but really it's not for work, and because colleges are very close to the workplace, Mm, it's a bit forced and unnatural. So, for you guys out there, which camp do you fall into? Or do you think it's easier than ever or forced and unnatural? Good stuff. An interesting split. So, Craig, perhaps you'd like to tell us you know, why you chose what you did. Just picking on you because I know you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, interesting. So a bit of uncertainty about how to sort of moderate what the, the students do and maybe things about what is there out there. I certainly have that feeling sometimes where you know somebody will say, Well, what is it you want? And so well, I don't know what there is, so how can I choose? So Part of it is you know, on, on knowing ourselves and being comfortable with it ourselves. And others, it's um, listening to, to students and saying, well, how do you use it? How do we want to use it? And how do we, we know that um, these are the skills that we can, we can gather quite successfully? So it's actually quite a big debate, I think, that um, we can have around this. When we look at what the research tells us, we're looking at media outlets that have changed, disappeared, shifted direction. You know, when you, I mean, I used to love sitting down with the Sunday papers, spending a couple of hours looking, looking through them, digesting them, having a coffee, and so on. Now it's much more immediate. TV, radio, and newspapers are still big players, but a lot of it has shifted to online. So the way that we digest text is very different. Facebook, and I'll give you some figures um, shortly on that, has become incredibly important, and not just for, for social purposes. Um, I've heard of employers that check Facebook pages of potential employees just to see what sort of person they might be getting. Um, there's been a bit of criticism um, about you know, to what extent employers use digital skills and how much they fall behind what is happening, say, in the, the social lives of, of young people. So I decided to do a bit of research to find out whether that was true or not. And Again, I'll, I'll show you in a minute or two um, the sort of things that, that came up. Looking at our own language, you know, Google it, just click here, um, and the, the question there, if somebody asks you to, to be your friend immediately, 
10 years ago, I would have thought they'd be really, really forward. Don't know about you. Instagram a photo of their lunch, you know, because it's fantastic, and just post it. So what, what do you mean, post it? To me, growing up in the, the 50s and 60s, posting came with a big box at the end of the road, and you put a letter in it. Totally different now. So, question for you. Has learning and teaching changed as much as that in the last 10 years? Do you remember the times of memos put in pigeonholes? I'm sure David has memories of those sort of things, because he was around the same time as me. Don't want to put you on the spot, David, but you know, think about how much it has changed in the last 10 years. Has it kept up? Is there a bit of development that's needed? Give you a minute or two to think about that. No worries, David. And uh, okay, we don't have pigeonholes. What have we got, though? So has has learning and teaching changed as much? Maybe, probably not. What do you think, Cathy? Oh, interesting, more online working, yeah. I think there's still a skills gap. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. Um, I'll be able to catch up. I'm with Justin on the, the chalk dust. Okay. So how do we use the, the skills and resources that we've got to um, support learners that may well be ahead of us in some of the areas there. Is there a space for using learners as co-producers of learning so that there's less teacher-led approaches and more collaborative approaches with our students? Yep. Not all college students are confident in these sort of areas. I think it's really difficult that um, we've got a vast range of sort of skill levels. So you know, one size doesn't fit all. How do you introduce something that is, is brand spanking new to learners that might feel quite unconfident and others that want to zoom ahead and it's it's something that's been part of their life for years. I don't think it's easy. So co-creating with level five onwards. That's an interesting one, David. What do the rest of you think about that? Level five onwards. Let's get more collaboration with the students as co-producers. Students need to know how to learn first. So there's there's lots of things surrounding that um, way of working for for you folk that really needs teased out and supported. So some of it will be the work with students. Some of it will be the the different skill sets that that Craig mentions about maintaining uh, relationships and developing online relationships. Um, I can remember that from 
very early on with distance learning with students, it was very different. And even doing webinars just now, um, I can't see you. I can't see you nodding. Hopefully you're nodding, um, as opposed to shaking your head, going, oh, good grief. But that sort of um, relationship has to be developed in a different way. OK, moving on. So these figures, um, mostly from 2014-15, apart from the last one, Mobile users check their phones 100 times a day on average, more than 100 times a day. Facebook checked more than 14 times a day, 6 billion hours of videos every month on YouTube, 500 million tweets sent every day, video chat. And, I mean, the figures go on. WhatsApp users, 100 million daily active users, not just I've got a, an account, but actually active users. So, you know, this has all grown up in the last sort of 20 years. And big question for you, where do you think the communication units, where do you think those standards fit into the digital world? Are they open enough to allow the development of these sort of skills? Is it something that you think actually that's for somebody's other life, not their learning life. How, how do you think about that? I'm going to give you two or three minutes to, to really tease that out and maybe have a, a, a discussion um, amongst each other and ourselves about about the standards, because I know that you're all familiar with the, the communication unit standards, whether it's level four, five, six. Um, I'm going to leave level three and below just now, because I think that's a different sort of set of skills that we're introducing people to um, the whole idea of communication and sometimes digital skills. Lots of interesting comments coming up there. Um, thank you for that. The couple that I'd like to pick up on, um, from firstly from Cathy, um, the reading aspect of the communication unit, we can use assistive technology for that. I'm thinking particularly of um, the Scottish Voice, where it's a, a text reader. I don't know if you've if you've tried that, um, or the, your your learners have tried that. So there are ways that we can use assistive technology to to help make the the text uh, much more accessible. So actually using digital skills from um, Call Scotland, it's the, you probably know this that the um, the Scottish Voice is available in. Uh, male voice, a female voice, and there's also a now, as of last year, a Gaelic voice. So for um, for users of the the Gaelic communication unit, there's there's Kaylee, Katie, uh, available there. It's really good for for learners as well, uh, people learning Gaelic because if it doesn't sound right, then it probably isn't right the way that you've written it. And similarly, for checking spelling, for checking writing, for checking syntax, it's incredibly useful. So, unaided doesn't mean that they cannot be assisted, because they're still in control of the, um, the technology that's there. If you're using a spell check, for example, you still have to choose the right there for the, the context that it's being used in. So you still need to be able to use 
your um, cognitive skills as well as um, other skills, technical skills. So that's certainly something for, for having a another look at, Cathy. Reading with support, someone reading for them in community. Right. There's two bits here. One is the communication unit and having an AN other person reading it to them is different from having a text reader reading it to them because the person who's in control and you cannot read without um, putting intonation in, you cannot read when you see a comma without pausing. And a human person, <laughs> as opposed to a computer voice, would do that. Even if you think you can read as flatly as possible, so that all you're doing is decoding, it can't happen. You do that. Same with writing. Um, it would be an unreasonable adjustment for um, learners to have to spell every single word so that whoever was scribing did that. However, with technology, those can be overcome because you've got to select words. Yes, spell checkers can, can work and, and can be really, really helpful in terms of accessibility. Thank you, David. Read, write, gold. Um, there are there are lots of things um, that, that can help and um, I'd suggest that you get in touch with Call Scotland, C-A-L-L -L, Scotland. Um, they have a website but that's something we can maybe discuss um, offline or uh, at a later date. Um, can I go to something that, that Craig had mentioned and that's about having a specific outcome for online or um, e-communication. Um, that's an interesting one. Do you think that would be something that the rest of you could support? A yes, no, will do. Yep. Yep. Kathy? Kathy? Not sure. Okay. Interesting, because I think that's something that we certainly sort of wonder about. Um, I think there is some pressure to have uh, more linkage with ICT. And you'll see that in the, the slide that's on the screen now. This is from a, a report in 2014 from our external verifiers. And they're saying this is really good practice to have um, communication and ICT combined. The other bit that's that's praised is effective contextualisation, whether that's in a learning situation for people that are going on an academic route or whether it's in a vocational area. And I'm not going to labour that point because I think that um, even since 2014, there's been leaps and bounds in making things meaningful for learners that come there, come to college. Um, they don't come to, to learn communication. They come to be graphic artists or joiners or whatever and they want to be the best ones that can be um, really need yeah I think you're doing it just now yeah um, that's really good to hear it's how to how to do it and how to ensure that the the learners are confident and the staff are confident in doing that the as I say the the learners that were interviewed, and this is nationally confirmed that they were um, aware of the usefulness. I think that's changed over the last sort of 10 or 15 years where um, perhaps the, the relevance of all the core skills hadn't been as explicit as they, they have been in, in more recent years. So that's good. And they're appreciative of contextualised approach and make them meaningful. I think we know that. Another quick poll, very quick. Physical skills and digital, are they the same skills? So do you do the handwriting? Do you do online? And I'm talking about for learners, I'm not talking about for, for staff because I think there are, are differences for staff. Okay, dissolving into communication. So all the same thing. Uh, 
And the last one, employability. Do you need to have digital literacy skills in order to be employable these days? Thank you. Um, searching for jobs, applying for jobs. Most of it's online. Yep. <laughs> I think it's interesting that you know, when we look at the sort of skill sets and dissolving into to communication generally, that there really is a drive um, out there to make aspects of communication really quite digital and do we need any? Nearly all digital places have a Facebook page now. Yep. When I went to look for, you know, employability um, icons. So where are they? It was so easy to find. There's a bit for teachers. Teaching maths over the last 50 years. Um, you might find that quite interesting, Craig. Um, how, to, how has it changed? I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, but jobs generally, so either helping with jobs, applying for jobs, searching for jobs, getting more information about jobs, it's all there. And that's without going to my world of work. So it's really easy to find. The thing is, if you if you don't have the skills or you don't have the technology to support those skills, are you at a disadvantage um, in terms of employability? I think you are. I swithered about putting this slide up, I was saying to George earlier, do we really want Trump on my, my screen? Um, and something that I um, put it up because it, it sort of scared me, that um, in order to affect change, this guy can put up, I call my own shots and reach 24 million people. That, to me, is a case for learning ICT. It's a case for using digital skills. Yes, to read, but also because of the influence that um, the, the web has over 24 million people's lives. And that's just one instance. Um, I'd actually put that slide together before all the, the fuss about fake news. Because I was thinking more uh, at the time about the standards in in our qualifications and looking at, at you know how do you determine whether the source is authentic or or not? So how do you use um, critical reading skills, critical thinking skills to to determine things like that? Um, I certainly think when I when I saw that there's a big case for learning. And let's look at sources and let's look at believable, credible sources. Um, do you believe everything that you see on the web? And the answer is obviously not. How do you get your learners? How do you help your learners and support your learners to be critical readers? Social media, yeah very difficult to skim for info. And how do you help learners to question what they're reading? And that way, I, I would suspect that the, the techniques are, are very similar, you know, to um, what you read in newspapers as opposed to what you read on, on screen. But is there something different? Is it much more immediate, much more vibrant, much more chatty speaking to you? And what about audience? 
who do you write for if you're writing a Facebook page? Do you write for 24 million people or do you write for the one person that they talk about on radio? There's one person out there listening to you. Yep. Thanks, Justin. Um, skimming for info yep. and questioning. Is that something most of you find quite quite pertinent? So Justin using Facebook, others use Facebook when you're talking about audience. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty of how you explore these things. Yeah, it is hard. It is hard. Someone's using Twitter. Do you use it at all, Kathy or, or Craig? Do you use any of the social media for, or do your teams use that for exploring issues? Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe give you some ideas there. Interesting thought. One or two questions coming up now. Um, social media, in what way is that affecting our verbal and written communication? We talked about Googling it and you know, being friends with people, liking things. Is it trickling into our, it's all communication anyway, so we use it that way, or is it kept something separate, do you think? different forms. So this is yet another form. So we've had playground talk, we've had school talk, we've had the way you speak to your grandmother, we've got the formal one for business, we've got social chat, like this huge range now, which makes communication staff's jobs even more difficult, I would think. No distinction. This, this is something that's come up time and time again with employers. The idea that you should be able to separate one form of communication um, for one purpose from another form of communication for another purpose. Business communication is really quite different to what happens in social media. And I think getting that over to learners doesn't matter what age, it can trickle down and become confused. So something to, to bear in mind is it certainly comes comes across to us from our engagement with employers. I'm sure it comes from yours too. There's more examples of you know more and more acronyms, lots and hots, lower order thinking skills for those that are uh, new to that idea and higher order thinking skills, tons and tons there um, because it's immediate and it's quick. So slow time and quick time, quick time online. Okay. Just looking at the standards here, I'm going to go through these very, very quickly um, because I, I I see that we're we're now at nine minutes past one, and I don't want to keep you from uh, classes or, or lunch any more <laughs> than than we need to. So those are standards um, from our uh, core skill. You you recognise them quite quite well, I'm sure. Does it speak to you as a digital literacy, or does it speak to you as 
something that is quite static and doesn't encompass digital skills. It's very quick. Digital, yes or no? No, but it could be. No, but you have to be creative about it. And it has more, more aspects. Piece of writing to text. Thank you, Craig. I think we need to move some of our standards on. And I think that's what I've been trying to get at through, through the um, webinar today. But to test those ideas out with you and to see how you use them um, in, in real life. So, should reading in a digital world only non-fiction? Reliability of source, all of the above. Um, we need another session on the topic. <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> all of the above, plus more. Um, this one here, moving image, is included in the experiences and outcomes. We don't use it in um, in the communication standards. Again, maybe we should. Who knows? What do you reckon? Should we include moving image? Reading from film and video? We saw the number of, what was it, 600 billion videos downloaded from or watched on YouTube every month. Should we be doing that? Yep. Yes. <laughs> don't know. We don't want to put barriers um, in the standards for people, but we do want to encourage the development of skills that are going to be useful um, now and for the future. A wider one, but include the static one as well. Okay. Interesting. Thank you for that, Cathy. What about writing? Again, this is from the, the standards at National 5. We talk about dashes, brackets, colons, semicolons. I love semicolons personally. I think they are the bee's knees. I am a a semicolon Nazi almost. I love using them. But not everybody does. So, should writing include only formal language for a global audience, for functional purposes only? Should we have pens and paper at all? My last question. Text so important. No pens and papers, please. So just then, just to check, there isn't a comma after the no. Is there? Or is there? No. Pens and papers. Okay, it should be optional. Mm hmm Choice, personalization and choice. Okay. Okay. If one thing had to change in the communication standards to support learners in their learning for their personal life and their and their work what would it be if you had a, a magic wand and you could change one thing
Thank you, David. Back from opinion. Online and, and in person techniques. So being able to handle both. Thank you, Kathy. A bit too open. So with more examples of what meets and what doesn't meet, more about understanding the standards and we want to keep them context free so they can be applicable across all vocational contexts and other learning contexts. Answers to Woolley. So a bit more, a bit more um, exemplification in what the standards mean. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you for those. Um, your your wishes may come true. And again, it really depends on um, how things are out there and what we're we're looking. Thank you, David. I appreciate your t your time. Um, we're just finishing off. There's the late news. We have some more um, context contextual packages uh, commissioned. There's a national survey going out about core and other essential skills being released today. It's a survey monkey one. And anything else that you've got time to tell us or want to tell us just now, please use the chat box and do keep in touch. It's been really, really good listening to you. Um, if listening or reading are the same thing, um, on the chat room. And I hope you've enjoyed the webinar.